Hello, my name is Alan and I'm going to talk to you briefly about 3D printing. Today we will cover the basics of the machine, how it works, software requirements, design consideration, and advantages and disadvantages of the machine. Today we're at Hacker Lab, a hacker makerspace in Sacramento, California, and it is here that we will discuss and demonstrate some fundamental concepts of 3D printing. As always, the first thing to keep in mind is safety. An interesting characteristic of 3D printers is their variability. In front of me I have two models an Ultimaker 2 and a PrinterBot Play, two material extrusion printers. Even with this variability, there are a couple of common things to watch out for. As the build area is open, you want to be careful not to get your fingers caught or jammed in pitch points on the machine. Keep your hands clear while the machine is in operation. Also, the extruder tip can reach temperatures in excess of 230 degrees Celsius or 445 degrees Fahrenheit. Be mindful of the temperature of the extruder as you work with the machine. Also, some 3D printers have heated build plates to help with platform adhesion and build stability. The build plate doesn't get as hot as the nozzle, but still be careful. As I mentioned before, the machines we're using today are a PrinterBot Play and an Ultimaker 2. Both of these machines are often referred to as material extrusion or fused deposition modeling, abbreviated FDM, uh, type machines. One of the amazing things about 3D printing is that there are numerous methodologies. You also have laser centering, sometimes called powder bed fusion, that uses material granules that stick to each other after being hit with a high intensity laser beam. Material extrusion, or more specifically, fused deposition modeling, is arguably the most common type of 3D printing you will run across. Created by Stratasys founder S. Scott Crump over 25 years ago, it most often serves as a jump off point for 3D printing exposure. How does it work? Have you ever used a glue gun? Similar concept. You start with some sort of filament material, most often plastic, and it is fed into a heated chamber where it melts and is then pushed through a small orifice. As plastic is extruded from the printer head, the head then moves around the build area across a two-dimensional flat plane. While the head is moving, the molten plastic is deposited on the print bed, much like a pen writing on a sheet of paper. Once one layer has been completed, the print head then moves upward a fraction of a millimeter relative to the bed and repeats the process. This process repeats tens, hundreds, or even thousands of times, depending on part size, until the part is completed. Let's now talk about materials used with 3D printing. The most common plastic used are ABS and PLA. ABS stands for acrylonitrile butadiene styrene, which is a commonly used consumer plastic, formulated from various polymers that give it hardness, toughness, and temperature resistance. We use ABS for piping, tools, and even toys. In fact, ABS is the plastic that Legos are made out of. Anyone who has ever stepped on a Lego barefoot can speak to the toughness of ABS. PLA stands for polylactic acid, also known as polylactide. PLA is a bioplastic made from organic materials such as cornstarch, tapioca roots, and sugarcane. PLA is most often a good starting material for 3D printing because it's easy to use. When printing with ABS, you need to account for the fact that ABS expands and contracts as it is heated and cooled. Many 3D printers designed to handle ABS have some sort of mechanism in place to counteract this. For most of your less expensive machines, less than $5,000, this often takes the form of a heated build plate. The idea being that keeping the base at an elevated temperature helps keep the plastic from contracting upon cooling. PLA is not as thermally expansive, so this is not as large of an issue. Also, 3D printers that just handle PLA are less expensive because of the lack of bed heating. It is actually possible to build your own 3D printer with about $300 to $400 worth of material, provided you have access to a 3D printer and laser cutter. Things we both have at Hacker Lab, by the way. And to speak of do-it-yourself 3D printers, here we have a 3D printer derived from the Prusa Mendel model, which can be found at reprap.org. At the reprap website, you can find a lot of general and detailed information regarding 3D printers and plans and parts lists for some of the most popular build-it-yourself printers. Another thing you may notice is filament thickness. Common filament thicknesses are 3mm and 1.75mm. The Ultimaker 2 here uses 3mm filament, and the PrinterBot Play uses 1.75mm filament. A good exercise would be to research the benefits and drawbacks of filament thicknesses. By no means are ABS and PLA the only filaments available for 3D printing. There are numerous filaments available. If anything, filament options have multiplied in recent years. There are clear filaments, flexible filaments, conductive, wood infused, carbon fiber infused, and the list goes on. When using these filaments, you want to keep in mind whether or not these would be compatible with your machine. The next thing to talk about is how to generate files for your 3D printer. So let's talk about the 3D printing workflow a little bit. 3D printing most often starts with an STL file. An STL file format is used to represent 3D geometry. This is the file that holds the data representing your object to be printed. STL file format is not the only file format used for 3D printing, but is by far the most common. 
This STL file is then input into what is called a slicer program. The slicer program reads the 3D information and then creates another file called a G-code file affected by parameters you specify that can control the movement of the motors and temperature control. This file is then loaded into the machine and run. To speak a bit more to file formats, one of the most common questions I hear regarding 3D printing is, does X program work with a 3D printer? And the answer is, not exactly. To better visualize the relationship between STL files and 3D printers, let's use PDF files as an example. PDFs are useful because of their utility. You can send a PDF file just about anywhere, and then you can then open the file and you can send it to a regular printer. You can use a lot of different word processing programs to create them. Microsoft Word, LibreOffice, Google Docs, and the list goes on. Now each one of those programs has their own unique file format, but they all have the ability to output to PDF. And that file format is then able to be used by all. That's pretty much how STL files work. Just about any program that you can use to create 3D models, SolidWorks, Autodesk Inventor and Fusion 360, SketchUp, Blender, OpenSCAD, FreeCAD, all have their unique file formats, but all can export to STL format. Now in most cases, this conversion is one way. So make sure you have the program specific file saved as well. Once you have your STL file, you're ready to print. There's a lot of variability when it comes to 3D printers, and there is no place where that is more apparent than with slicer programs. A very popular slicing program, and the one I will be demonstrating, is Cura, which is made by Ultimaker. There are plenty of other options, and I would encourage you to check them out when you have a moment. I'm going to start by loading the STL file I would like to print in Cura. For this print, I will use a smiley face, drawn previously in SolidWorks. Once the STL file has been loaded, I'll be able to see a representative view of it on the printer bed. It is in this program that I'm able to set various parameters to control my print. The parameters that are good to keep in mind are the layer height, infill percentage, and shell thickness. Layer height is the thickness of each layer deposited by the 3D printer. Acceptable layer heights vary by machine, but for many consumer level printers, it can vary between 4 tenths and 1 tenth of a millimeter. Layer height has the most direct effect on print time and print resolution. Essentially, the smaller your layer height is, the more layers total for your print, which equals a longer print time. Infill is the density of the interior of a part. Many times, it is not necessary for parts to be printed solid. Often, you are 3D printing for a representative piece or to gauge form or fit. In these instances, printing the entire part solid can be unnecessary and inefficient. As the complete print time is related to how much plastic is used in a print, printing a part solid adds to that time and plastic used by a considerable factor. Once you've set your parameters, it's time to export your G-code file and run your print. So let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages of 3D printing. The biggest advantage of 3D printing has to be the flexibility in design. You have, in front of you, a machine that can literally make anything. If it can exist in real 3D space, you can build it using a 3D printer. With that in mind, the 3D printer is an excellent choice for building prototypes of design ideas. You can look at pictures, you can talk to people about an idea, but nothing beats actually holding an object in your hand. Another benefit to 3D printing is the relative speed of manufacture. 
I like to say that any 3D print worth making is going to take at least 30 minutes to build. Depending on part volume and geometry, print time can easily shoot up to 4 to 5 hours and beyond. Often the immediate reaction is to remark on the slowness of the build time, but one has to keep in mind relative speed when thinking about production. If I was going to get something manufactured, for example, from a model shop or a machinist, there are numerous stops in that process. You have to get the order, time has to be scheduled for the manufacturing, the finished product has to be shipped to you. The part could easily take one, two weeks from when you create the order. If I have an eight hour print, I can load up my part, start the machine, go home, and when I return the next day, I have my part. Safety note, keeping in mind the inherent risk of leaving a 3D printer running unattended. It is a very powerful thing to be able to go from nothing to a part in less than 24 hours. Another factor to keep in mind is cost. If you have your own desktop 3D printer, which I'll define as less than $5,000, ABS or PLA at the time of this video costs somewhere around $30 a kilogram, which you can get a lot of prints out of. However, there is always a trade-off. It is the responsibility of the user to be able to troubleshoot and maintain the machine. 3D printed services are also an option, but those can get very expensive very quickly, so be aware. Vertical and horizontal shells refer to material thickness between the outside and the interior of the part. If a part was printed with 0% infill, meaning it was completely hollow, the shell thickness would be the thickness of the exterior walls of the part. Support material is another consideration for 3D printers. Depending on the geometry of your part, you may run into situations where the part cannot print unassisted. The last factor I want to speak to is the structural integrity of your finished part. Earlier we talked about how a 3D printed part is built layer by layer. Because of that, you can often see the grains in a part with the layers stacking on top of each other. The strength of a 3D printed FDM part is often dependent on the direction of the grain. Think of a piece of wood. If you wanted to split a log with an axe, you would place it on its end and strike axially downward because of the grain direction in the wood, cleaving in one strike. Where if you imagine a lumberjack chopping down a tree, he is attacking the wood laterally and it takes more effort and more chops to bring the tree down. Keeping that in mind, strain across a 3D printed part behaves similarly. You will have more strength if the grain of your 3D print is perpendicular to your potential load direction. This grain is also a consideration when figuring out how to orient your part for printing. I'm Alan Ware with AMW Design and I want to thank you for watching this video. I hope that it's provided information to help you step boldly into 3D printing. I want to thank Hacker Lab for the use of their facilities and the Sierra College Center for Competitive and Advanced Technologies for giving me the opportunity to make this video. Thank you.